so welcome to the library basics class uh, spring 2021. This is a little bit about me. Um, my name is Kendra Harrell. I'm a librarian here at Texas A&M University, Texarkana, and my contact info is up on your screen. My office hours are really variable right now. Um, the library has us working um, part remote and part on campus, so um, can't really depend on me to be in my office at any one particular time. So the best way to reach me is email. Um, and then I also cover the library chat uh, periodically. So. Um, as far as me personally, I've got dogs, cats, I like to crochet, embroider, and sew. Um, I'm a fan of sci-fi and fantasy, and my favorite book is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but the movie is only okay. These are some of the other full-time librarians that can help you with library resources. Terry is our library director. Nisha Federick is our reference librarian. And Olivia Garcia is, oh, sorry, Olivia Poulton, I need to update that. Um, is our electronic and digital services librarian. There's lots of other helpful people at the library that aren't on this slide, but um, these are some of the key full-time librarians that'll help you out. So the University Library is the John F. Moss Library, and that's in the University Center building of main campus in Texarkana. The service desk is on the third floor, just inside the library entrance, and most of our books are on the fourth floor. So the library has a ton of books, but this presentation is mainly focusing on our electronic resources. We've got a lot of ebooks, online journals, and other online resources that you can use without ever stepping a foot into the library, and that's especially useful right now. So this course is meant to be kind of a practical guide to using the library's resources for general research. Um, you can use this in any specialty that you're going into. So for the education classes, um, it's it's going to help you out as give you kind of a basic understanding of how to use the library's website and our database resources. The goals are to define database, to find WorldCat discovery on the library's website, use it to search for resources and narrow down your search results, renew a checkout, request an interlibrary loan, find course reserves, find individual databases on the library's website. We're going to define peer review and figure out how to find help when we need it. So in this first section, we're going to look at what is a database. In order to find a resource, it's kind of important to know what you're looking at. So when I talk about library databases, what am I really talking about? So a database is essentially a collection of information stored in electronic format. Sometimes a database can be completely general and wide ranging in what it addresses like Wikipedia, which is a, you know, a crowdsourced encyclopedia. Sometimes databases are going to be more themed like Wikipedia, which is an online Star Wars Wikipedia um, that obviously specializes in Star Wars information. So like both of those, lots of databases are actually free to use online, but also like those, many databases are not academic databases. So we're gonna focus on academic databases. Information that's stored in databases comes in lots of different types. Journal articles are one of the big ones, especially for what y'all will be doing. But uh, other categories that you might see are newspaper and magazine articles, books, ebooks, videos, and images. So when I say journal, what does that really mean exactly? Well, you can think of a journal as a collection of articles like a magazine, but it's usually with a lot fewer advertisements. Um, peer review journals are used by academics of all professions to update each other about their work inform the world about discoveries or changes in research, or just to contribute to their field in a formal way. Journals are published on a quicker timetable than books are. Because of this, they're more current and often more relevant to trending topics in a field of study. And because they're also relatively short compared with books, they can provide targeted specific information about a single topic. Now, a vast majority of the library's journal articles are available through electronic databases but there's still some that we have only available in print in the library. These journals cannot be checked out, but they are available for use in the library. If you need to access one of those journals and you can't come in or you're a distant student, contact the library for assistance. We can usually find the exact article you need and scan it and send it to you on an as needed basis. So how are library databases different from you know, Wikipedia? We're gonna focus on three main ways, but there are a lot of ways they're different. One important distinction is that they're often not free. 
which means your tuition and government funding enables the library to purchase subscriptions for them that then you can access through the library's website. That's why it's important to go through the library's website to get to those resources. It's kind of like a portal because if you try to access them just straight through Google, like if you go to just jstore.com and you're not on campus using campus IP addresses, then you'll be directed to pay for that content when you really don't need to. Um, another important difference is that the library databases are aimed at academic content. So, you know, if you're researching sharks, you're not going to find the video for baby shark, but you're going to find journal articles about shark behavior or about biology or history. Um, another of the reasons that information in library databases is different from Wikipedia is that a lot of it is peer reviewed. So I'm sure you've heard this term before and hopefully you know what it means, but just to review, this means that when a journal publishes an article, they have other professionals in that field review the content of the work first to make sure that it lives up to the standards of that field. So for example, if a scientist submits an article on shark bites that's going to be published in the American Journal of Forensic Medicine and Pathology, and it has references to the different sized bites of baby shark versus mommy shark, citing the baby shark video on YouTube, the other scientists in charge of reviewing the submissions will flag that so it does not get published. Uh, this process is meant to control the quality of an academic journal and maintain high standards for published articles. So Wikipedia articles, for example, are not subject to that sort of filtering. Now the library has two different types of databases. Um, some of the databases contain the full text of journal articles. So you would click on that journal title and it would bring you to the entire article. Some of them only contain partial text, like an abstract or an index of articles. These can be useful for locating things that you can then request an ILL and interlibrary loan for. But if we only have partial text access, that means there will be a delay in getting full text for that article because you will have to request it. So in that section just that we just finished, we reviewed databases kind of in general. And I wanna pause here and ask if there are any questions so far. I have a quick question because I actually did this on purpose to, to um, kind of look at this, but what would you say the difference between the electronic databases we have behind the library and then um, Google Scholar are? So with the electronic databases that we have in the library, these are ones that are not only integrated into our system so that you can actually search for them all at once, um, but they don't have as many they don't have as many steps to, to get to the full article usually. I'm not completely well versed in Google Scholar because I've been using the library stuff for so long now that I haven't really kept up to date with Google Scholar, but that's a really good question. And I can definitely um, look into it more and get back to you after the presentation. Sure, and I'll just point out because I, I purposely had them do a Google Scholar search this last awesome. week so that they could make them some comparisons. Cool. Yeah, and so, you know, a lot of times um, what I look for in Google Scholar is not accessible, so I actually have to go into the library anyway to actually get the article. So I, I'm one of the things I was um, seeing if they found that problem as well. Mm -hmm. So Google that. Scholar, it's almost more of a, a partial text type of access. So they're finding yeah. information about the article, but maybe not the full article. Right. Okay. So, so or, yeah. I have an, or it sends me to a place where I have to pay for it or, you know, something like that. For, yep. I actually will go on there real quick sometimes just to do a quick search. Hmm. If I really want to do something in depth, I always go in the library. Cool. And yeah, that's a really good point because you can, um, if you find an article that you want to see if you have full access to um, through some other resource like Google Scholar, you can actually go in and search on the library's uh, main search, the WorldCat Discovery search, and see if you can locate that exact same article and have instant access. So that's a really good way to uh, kind of get around that whole paywall issue. Any other questions so far? Awesome, all right, let's move on to the next section here. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So to get to the library's website through the main AM homepage, uh, AM Texarkana homepage, you can mouse over the academics menu and then choose John F. Moss Library. Or I'll show you on the next slide here. Um, you can also use the quick links. And we're down there near the bottom of the quick links from the main page. And um, I think those menu options are basically on every page of the AM website. So it doesn't have to be the main homepage if you're just doing some other stuff on the web page, you can still find the quick links and the academics link. And once you're on the library's page, um, which you can still get to through the shortcut um, library.tamut.edu, um, WorldCat Discovery is very prominent on the main page. It's the big search bar that's right in the middle of the page. And from here, um, you can choose to narrow down if you want to search everything or if you just want to search for books or just articles or just videos. Um, now, the book search does include ebooks. So if you're only looking for print or you're only looking for ebooks, once you get into the search results, you can kind of cut those out and, and get, get it narrowed down more. So in that very, very short section, we reviewed where to find WorldCat Discovery. Um, I'm going to continue without pausing for questions this time because it was pretty basic. Can you hear me? Um, so the WorldCat Discovery uh, system that we have, it's a Google style search. It searches most of our databases and it gets you a lot of results, but that can be good and bad. So if you enter a simple search keyword like bees, for example, you'll get back over 42,000 results and that's complete information overload. It's way too much to search through to find what you're looking for. Um, so in order to make searches more effective, we have to narrow down our topic and narrow down some other factors as well. So one way to get fewer and better search results is to add keywords to your search and use the Boolean operators or and or not in between them to link them and kind of make your search more complex. So using the word or in a database means that you're searching for multiple keywords equally. So for example, if you search for dog or canine or hound, the results will contain articles that mention any of those terms. Um, any of the results might contain only the word dog or only canine or only hound. And this retrieves a lot more results than if you search for only canine. Now, when you use and, you actually get fewer results than when you use or, which seems counterintuitive at first, but and links them, it links the terms into one unit essentially. So employee and motivation will only bring results that have both of those terms occurring in the result. Now you can use not to uninclude a keyword in your search. This, this works the same way that a minus sign works in Google. So if you're doing a Google search for like cookie recipes, and you keep getting back a ton of Pinterest pages that you don't want to dig through to find what the preview was showing you. Um, you can actually change your search to cookie recipes, minus sign, no space, Pinterest, and it'll eliminate all the Pinterest results from your search, which is very handy. So this is the same concept except with the word not. So you can use uh, not to search for say computer virus, but if you don't wanna search for worms, you don't wanna include those in your results, you would do computer virus, not worm. Now, truncation is a great shortcut. With truncation, you can put in a symbol, usually an asterisk, and the search will include all the variants of a word. For example, teach asterisk will retrieve results for teach, teacher, teachers, teaching, etc. So you, you don't have to come up with every version of a key term, just the root portion. Um, when you're trying to search on a specific topic, it does help to break down that search into the keywords of your topic. For example, if you're doing a project on how stress affects the academic performance of students in higher education, you could break that down into the keywords stress, academic performance, students, higher education. It seems like it makes sense. Now, because academic performance is multiple words, if you put it in parentheses or in quotations, um, it'll help keep that phrase intact in the search so it won't separate it out into academic and performance. Now, also, if you truncate student, that's gonna allow you to get student and students. And by truncating the term university and college, you can get university, universities, or college, colleges. So truncating just kind of gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility in your searches so that you can allow for plurals and for different endings on words that might not show up otherwise. 
So if you want to find an exact phrase in the databases um, and in WorldCat Discovery, you can put it in quotation marks. Um, this isn't always going to be the best way to find something unless you're looking for something very specific or maybe you have a portion of a title of an article and you're trying to find that exact article. This can be a kind of a quick and dirty way to search for that. So for instance, if you find an article on Google Scholar that, um, that you want to try and quickly locate in the library databases to see if we have it, you might um, copy and paste just uh, a section of that article, art the article title um, and put it in quotation marks and then see if it pops right up. And very often they do. Um, if they don't, I'll show you how to do an interlibrary loan request so you can still get a copy of that article. So a Boolean search using and, or, or not is gonna be the best way to find what you're looking for in WorldCat Discovery and in most of the library databases. In this section, we reviewed some basics on searching for resources, and I'm gonna pause now to see if we have any more questions on this specific area. All right, so we're gonna move right along. So let's go into an example search in WorldCat Discovery to find even more search strategies and to see what the results pages actually look like. <clears throat> so I put in a search under just the everything section on the search bar for bees and Paul asterisk and pesticides. So Paul gets me pollen, pollination, pollinator, any other words with that, words with that root on them. So I could also get useless things like polling or polywog, but I'm, I'm kind of assuming and hoping at this point that those combined with and actually kind of makes it contextual and that something that has bees and pesticides won't necessarily bring up polling. <laughs> but yeah, who knows, you never know. Um, if that doesn't work the way I want it to, I can try putting in something more specific like pollen or pollinators. Um, but just that search brings up 1,394 results. And that is a lot, but we can narrow that down with uh, the limiters that are over on the left side of the search results page. So let's look at how this results page is set up. We've got the limiters over here on the side, which are ways that we can limit the results. And where I've indicated with the blue kind of rectangle, rounded rectangle thingy, that's where those are. Um, now in the center where the results boxes are, the one, two, three, et cetera, um, there's already a lot of information in there too so that we can look through without even having to click through to anything. So we're gonna look at that. So in this number one result here, we've got uh, an ebook. And we've got a view ebook button that'll take us right to the ebook directly. Now, over on the right side, you can also click cite, and it pulls up a citation box for that ebook where you can uh, pick out, you know, if you want APA, if you want MLA, um, it'll give you kind of a, a little bit you can copy and paste for your citation. And if you click on the link button next to that, it's going to give you a link that you can go back to that resource later to get to. And that link is, um, that link is supposed to be built in with our library info in that link. So it's, it, you would be able to get to it even if you didn't go through the library website because it's a direct link including our, including the library information in that link. So it'll make you log in, but it'll get you to the full article and not just some kind of page that says, oh no, you don't have access to that. Um, you can also click email to send information about the resource via email. It doesn't send the whole article to you. It basically sends a citation to you. And then um, you can also click save to put the resource in your saved items folder in WorldCat Discovery. Now I'm gonna go into this save button real quick here because if you do choose to use that save button and you're not logged into WorldCat Discovery, the information won't be saved when you're done searching. It's just gonna go away. Um, so you have to actually be logged into WorldCat Discovery for it to remember that you saved that um, once you close your browser and, and exit out of your, your searching. And I'll show you how to log in. But first we're gonna look at the limiters over here. So I'll kind of explain what the different ones mean. They are different from our older system that we replaced, um, I believe early last year. Um, but the ideas are still the same. You're gonna narrow down your search results. So the very top option is really handy. It keeps the limiter selections for your next search. So if you didn't get what you were looking for 
and you want to try a new search, uh, but you want to keep all these limiters that you've checked off the same, just keep that one switched on and you're good. It'll keep those same settings. The held by library section is particularly important. This is one of the major ways that our WorldCat discovery system is different from our old swoop system. Um, WorldCat is linked into libraries worldwide, hence WorldCat, cat, cat meaning catalog. Um, so you're not just searching our library or you don't just have access to search our library, you have access to search tons of libraries, lots and lots of libraries. Now, not every single library uses this system, but there are so many that do. And the system searches A&M, Texarkana, and Texarkana College's resource by default because you have access to both libraries. But if you check off libraries worldwide, you'll be opening up your search to any of the libraries that use this WorldCat system. That means you might not have instant access to all the resources because we don't have them, but they are available somewhere else and you can ask for them. Um, so there may be a delay, but you'll be able to cast a much wider net with your search. And this is especially important um, when you are trying to get to um, requesting an interlibrary loan and, and we'll go over that in detail. Now, scrolling further down on that, that left side of your results screen, there's a format limiter. So this is where you can choose if you wanna narrow down your search to only articles, only books, only eBooks, et cetera. If you click the show more option, that's going to give you even more of a breakdown. Um, so you can you can search um, by specific format. Now, if you're looking for an academic article, you would just click off, you just check off the article option here. Um, in the content type limiters, you can choose a few different options. Full text, and uh, full text is, is an important one. So that means you have full access to the entire article immediately. Um, if you don't check that off, it's going to include some partial text. Now, open access resources are resources that are already free to you that you could find through the open web, but um, we've included them in the library search, uh, linked into this search just for convenience, essentially. Um, the peer reviewed option on here is especially important because, well, professors often require you to use peer reviewed articles in your projects and, and that is important. So if you're doing a research project that does require peer reviewed sources, you can quickly and easily sort them out by checking off this box. And I'll show you another way to kind of double check and see if a resource is peer reviewed later. By using the publication year limiters down there, you can also you can use a preset option. They've got last five years, last 10 years, last 25, or you can do a custom range. So if you're looking for something that's been published in the last, say, three years, you can enter in the custom year range there and it'll cut out everything older. Or if you're looking for something, you know, published in the early 1900s, you can customize that too. Further down, and yes, there are a ton of limiters. That's, this is one of the the amazing things about this, this search actually is that there are tons of limiters and you can narrow things down after you've searched and that cuts out a lot of the junk. Um, so scrolling down, you can find limiters that allow you to choose a specific author, uh, a specific subject, language, and more. So if you're just looking for resources in English, you can check off English. And in this case, that'll eliminate three Spanish options. Um, if you're just searching for, um, you know, Let's see, what have we got in here? If you're just searching for invertebrates, information specifically about invertebrates in biological science, you can check that off and it'll get you three options that are specifically in that section. Um, a, the subject limiter can be really useful, but it can also be a little tricky. So feel free to check if you're, if you're just starting a search and you wanna kind of cut out some things that you know you don't need, like let's say that law option on the bottom, uh, let's say you really just aren't interested in the laws regarding the, the bee search, then you can check off everything but that. So don't narrow down your search results too much until you know exactly what you're looking for, but this is a really good way to cut out stuff that you're just not looking for. So let's say that you do find an article that you really like and you want to look at the full article. So if you click on view full text, you'll have to log into the university first to get the article. So if you're following along on your browser, you'll eventually come across this page. This is where you log in with your university credentials. 
uh, to prove that you're allowed access to information behind the paywall. So this login is the same as your Google ID. It's the same as, as the login you should use for Blackboard. If you are having trouble logging into the library's website using this, um, unfortunately, the library can't reset it for you. You have to contact IT directly. Um, you know, do all the usual things, make sure your caps lock's not on, make sure that, you know, you're putting in the right password, et cetera. But, um, but IT can reset it for you and help you get in. Uh, the library, if it's a, simply a login problem, the library won't be able to reset that for you. Now, once you have signed in, the article will load. And from there, you can either download a PDF, you can send it to yourself in an email. There's a variety of other options depending on the database that the article's from. Because once you click through on WorldCat Discovery, it takes you out of WorldCat Discovery, which is just our search our search engine essentially, and it brings you to the database that has that specific article. So each database is going to look a little different, but they're all going to have essentially the same options. So in this section, we looked at how to narrow down our search results using WorldCat Discovery. I'm gonna pause here, take a sip of water and see if anybody has any questions so far. Well, she's taking a second to get a drink of water. so. Who can tell me about um, when you're researching a problem, something that's going on is, that's a, a problem, how many years back do you wanna go? Five. Yeah, so you wanna keep it within the last five years to, to really look at the problem. Very good. So that, that five year quick button on the, uh, the search results is really handy in that case because then you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next section. Let's see, okay. So now we're gonna talk about how to renew a book that you've actually checked out in WorldCat Discovery. I'm going over this, even though this doesn't necessarily res um, link into the electronic resources, it has changed since we, we upgraded the system. So I do wanna review it real quick. Um, now, unfortunately with this system, we do not have any longer have the option to renew via text. So you won't be getting those, do you want to renew texts anymore, but it is still very simple. Um, the sign in button, how you actually log into WorldCat Discovery. And this is also how you, you see that there's that my items option with a little star next to it um, in that gray bar. That is where when you're searching and you click save, that's where it goes. And if you're not signed in, it doesn't stay there. Um, so if you sign in first and then save it, then you're good and it'll stick around in that folder. Um, all you have to do is click the sign in button that's in the upper right corner of WorldCat Discovery. And if you can't find this screen, like if you're if you go to the, the main library webpage and you start to make your search and um, you want to sign in, just go ahead and make the search, go ahead and enter the search and then um, you'll be able to find that button once you're on the results page. Just on the main library page, we don't have, um, we just have the search box. We don't have the full like WorldCat Discovery page. So once you make your search, all that stuff will be there. So if you need to get to the screen um, without really searching for something, do a random search and it'll pop right up and you can click sign in. And once you click that button, it'll prompt you to sign in with the exact same login. So Eagle ID, same as Blackboard. And then once you are logged in, your name will be displayed in the corner instead of the login button. So there's, there's me, there's Kendra. Um, so if you click on your name and expand the menu under your name and you choose my account, it's gonna give you a list of the items that you have checked out. And as long as they're not overdue already, it'll give you a renew button. And you can click that and it'll automatically renew it for you. And if it, the renew button isn't working or if it's not there, you just need to contact the library and we'll get it straightened out for you. So that was just reviewing how to check, how to renew a checkout. Um, the important thing to remember there is that um, once you log in, you have access to that stuff. So first step is logging in. <laughs> We're gonna talk about interlibrary loan next. And this, this works for both print books and for electronic articles and other media. Now, this is specifically for resources that the library does not already have access to. So 
Interlibrary loan or ILL is essentially a service that the library offers to fill temporary needs for resources that we don't own or subscribe to. ILLs essentially allow us to check out items from other libraries. So we're borrowing them from other libraries. For physical books that involves, you know, mail or having a courier bring it over. Um, right now, because of coronavirus, we're focusing more on electronic ILLs, but, um, but there are still some libraries that are lending physical books. Most of the libraries we'd normally ask for loans are only doing electronic though. So don't be too surprised if you ask for a physical book and maybe you get back um, uh, a note in your email saying, do you just need a specific chapter or anything that we could scan an email? Um, so once you do put in an ILL request, keep an eye on your email. Now the ideal electronic ILL kind of process would look like this. You identify what resource you want and you submit the request to the library. You receive a response from library staff, um, including either a link or a PDF to the resource that you requested. Now, not every single ILO request goes as planned, but the library will attempt to help you as best we can, including sometimes if we're able to purchasing an ebook copy of a resource if it's available. Um, just make sure that you do keep an eye on your email, like I said, after your request, because we will try and get back to you as quickly as possible. And there are two different ways to kind of get to an ILL request. And um, one is either you know the exact resource you're looking for and you search for it without finding it in the AM Texarkana catalog. The other one is you did a keyword search in WorldCat Discovery, found a resource that you want to look at, but it's not one that we have right now. It's essentially just two different pathways to the same point to where you're not getting what you need from the library's website. Um, the next steps are the same regardless of how you approach the problem. Um, you would check off libraries worldwide in the limiters. So in that held by library section, instead of just keeping it to the local college libraries here, you would check off libraries worldwide and you'd search for that specific item that you wanted to request. Once you find it, there's going to be, um, and if, if, you, if you look for it and all of a sudden there it is, there's a link that says access this item or, or go to full text, then maybe you got lucky and we actually do have it. Um, and it just wasn't popping up right in the other searches for some reason. But if it says held by other libraries worldwide, then you wanna click on that and open it up. And once you have gone into the details of the article, you can expand it to reveal more options such as request item through interlibrary loan. So that's the button you're looking for and you click that and it opens up a pre-populated form. So it's already got the information about the actual article that you were looking at. It's got that in there. You just need to put in your information. So if you need the article by a specific date and then if it's unavailable before that date, like if it takes us too long to find it, um, that you don't need it anymore, then you can put in the date there. And then the amount that you're willing to pay, some libraries that we ask for, for loans, they do require a fee. Now, this is actually pretty rare, but usually the fee is less than $10. So if it is something you dearly need, um, then you can, you can put in there what you're willing to pay, but you can also just leave that blank and we would contact you if we had questions about that. Um, on the bottom, you put in your contact information, including name, email address, uh, patron ID would just be your student ID number. And then once you submit that form, it goes to a library worker who will work on fulfilling the request and will contact you with questions if necessary. Like I said, in the ideal ILL situation, you'll just get an email with a link or a PDF and you won't have to kind of negotiate any of the, the difficult options such as fees or um, long delays. But depending on how difficult that resource is to find um, and if it is available only in print, there can be issues. So just keep an eye on your email. So in that section, we reviewed how to request an interlibrary loan. And I'll pause very briefly here just to see if anybody has any questions about that. Has anybody ever done an interlibrary loan? I have not. I've, I've never come across that where I've had to ask for that before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't either. It's actually a really wonderful benefit if you um, are looking for something, so. 
It's especially if you, like we were talking about earlier, if you find something on say Google Scholar that doesn't pop up in the library search, but if you open it up to that all libraries worldwide thing, and then you do find it and you really want it, you can just ask us for it. So it's, it's a, a neat little trick that um, a lot of people don't use because they don't realize it's there necessarily. So it's a, it's a good way to find um, something specific that you really want to look at that isn't popping up. All right, we're going to review briefly how to find course reserves on the new um, WorldCat system. So for course reserves, um, I'm going to show you how to identify what your professor has put on reserve for you, and then I'll go over kind of how to get access to the reserve books. So on the WorldCat Discovery screen, um, and this, this this is the screen after you do a search. So if you need to get to this directly, um, just you can just go to the library's website, type in a random search, and it'll it'll bring up this page with this menu. Um, at the top, there's that gray bar, and it's got a course reserves link, in the very first one. So if you're starting um, from this page, you'll just click on course reserves. It'll take you into this page with a search bar. You can search by course number, um, by instructor, or you can just scroll down and look at the book information that's up. So the usual, the usual kind of procedure for accessing course reserves is to go to the library and ask for the title at the front desk because we have back in the back uh, where people can't browse uh, the books, we've got a section that's just for course reserves, that's just for books that professors have specifically requested us to keep there for their students. Um, because of um, how we're handling quarantining the books, uh, which currently we do have them on a one week quarantine before we let someone else handle them. Um, we're kind of handling the course reserves a little bit differently right now. Um, the best way to get a course reserve is to contact the library, email us, uh, preferably just the library help at tamut.edu email address, say, I need to get access to say chapters two through four of this course reserve book. How do I do that? And um, on request only currently, we are finding either electronic access or arranging for physical checkout of materials. And depending on copyright restrictions, we are occasionally scanning specific chapters for specific students um, to let them have access temporarily. But that's only because uh, we're in this extreme situation where we're trying to limit physical access to the books. So if you do have a professor that said they put a book on reserve, um, check on the reserves page, make sure that it's actually on there. And whether it is or not, you just would would end up emailing as much information about it as you could to library help at tamut.edu and we'll help you get it sorted out. So we, we kind of just talked about course reserves. I, I know it's a little kind of wishy-washy on that right now, just because there's the procedures are changing almost every week. So, <laughs> so um, the, the big kind of message there is contact the library. Um, now, WorldCat Discovery's tools are very helpful. So it's it's a like like I said, it's a Google style search. It's a centralized search. Um, but if you're getting too much junk in your search results, you really want to narrow it down more. You can actually narrow your search down even further, but you have to kind of go back to the beginning. Um, if you choose a specific database that's already targeted to your discipline or topic, you're going to get more specific information. You're going to get it faster. On the left side of the library's web page that library.tamut.edu there is this main menu it's about library services locate etc um, if you click on locate library resources it brings you to a page with a menu and the very first option is for articles use a database so if we click on database there that's going to take us to our a to z databases list this is all the individual databases that we have most of which are factored in when you search WorldCat Discovery, but this is kind of the, the breakdown of each individual database. So these are sortable by subject, by type, and you can also just search the list of databases. Now this won't, if you search on this page, it's not searching the databases, it's searching the list of databases. So kind of show you more about that here. Um, okay, so one good trick on this page is to use the subjects dropdown. You're going to find options all the way from like biology, psychology, education, social work. Um, this sorts the databases for you and gives you a targeted list of databases that are in that subject. 
if you use the search option, like I said, it's not searching the database, it's searching the list of databases. So if you search for say literary criticism in this list, the databases that come up will have descriptions beneath them that include literary criticism in some way. And you can look and see which database you wanna actually use to search. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this page is that if you see a database description that has abstracts or index in it, probably not full text. You're probably just gonna be looking at essentially citations for articles. Um, so depending on what you're trying to do, that might not be the best option. So we're gonna kind of do an, an example here. So we're gonna go into that first option under when, when I search for literary criticism, the first one that popped up was literature criticism online. Now this is a Gale database. So this is, there's tons of different companies that the library buys database subscriptions through. There's Gale, there's EBSCO is a huge one, ProQuest. They're all just different companies that make databases for us to use. So all the Gale databases are gonna look kind of similar. All the EBSCO databases are gonna look kind of similar. And once you've done enough kind of poking around in the databases, you'll be able to see which ones are which. Um, Gale usually looks like this. It usually has a simple search bar at the top. You can click on that advanced button um, and it'll take you to this um, kind of easy Boolean operator search system where you can build in your terms. So if you searched, if you put a search term in the first box, and you want to change the and option to or, just hit that drop down. It'll give you the other Boolean operators and you can switch them out and it'll kind of build your search equation for you. So for instance, we're going to do a really simple search. We're going to put in Walt Whitman in one line and poem in the next line. So what we're going to get out of that, it, it kind of builds us a little search equation, Walt Whitman and poem. And just searching in this one database, not WorldCat Discovery, but just this Gale Literature Criticism it brings us 1,624 results for Walt Whitman and Poem. The good news, there's limiters in almost every database. Um, they might look different and have different categories, but that's actually a really good thing because they're tailored to the specific database that you're using. They're customized. They've got they've got it broken down in a way that makes more sense for this information. So for instance, You've got your general you know, subjects here, but you've also got who it's about, um, the name of the work, and so on. Um, just going through and clicking off limiters, I was able to narrow down my results from you know, over 1,500 to only 26, and that's a lot easier to look through. Um, I do want to point out here, this database does not have a peer-reviewed limiter. Literature criticism is inherently opinion-based and a lot of these articles and journals of this type are not gonna be peer reviewed. So that's something to keep in mind and make sure you're following your professor's instructions depending on the assignment. Now you can save the resource to a folder just like you would in WorldCat Discovery, but that is a Gale folder. <laughs> so you would have to be signed into Gale to, um, to make that folder stick essentially. Now you can also, it gives you a lot of other really good options. You can download it. You can send it to your Google Drive or OneDrive. Um, you can, just like in WorldCat Discovery here, you can create a citation. So there's, there's other options other than saving it to a folder. Just be kind of wary whenever you see in search results pages, saving to a folder, kind of think, what is that folder? What, you know, is this, is this a folder on my computer? Is it a folder on theirs? Am I signed into something? Um, Honestly, if you, if, unless it's just not feasible for you, I recommend downloading it or saving it to a cloud drive. Um, if it is something you think you're going to need to look at again, even if you, you're not sure, I would go ahead and save it um, just because it can be hard to refine something you've already found, especially if you're poking around a lot of different databases in a search session. Um, one trick that I also use is I just have a Word document open and I will go ahead and make a citation and paste it in there. Um, and then that way I can not only refine something um, that I may have lost track of, or um, I don't have to go back and find it again if I want to just generate a quick citation. Um, if I don't feel like putting it together from scratch, then um, that's an easy way to just kind of create a list for yourself and you can go back later and find it. So choosing a database, we're just going to kind of go through the steps again real quick because I know it can be a little confusing, especially if you haven't really messed with individual databases before. You would go to locate 
on the library's website and then choose the database option. You'd search or sort that database list to find the right resource. Then you use that data, you'd go into that database and you use their search system to find it instead of going through WorldCat Discovery. You'd use the Boolean operators to refine the search. You can um, go to the advanced search option in order to kind of build it um, in like a form, or you can just type it in. And you'll wanna still use limiters to focus your results and then save your article somehow so that um, you're not having to refine things later, which it's always a pain. Um, so in that section, we kind of looked at one example of finding an individual database on the library's website. There's so many, there's, I think there was what, 280 or some odd on there. So I'm not gonna go into each type and each you know company's version of it. Um, just kind of keep in mind that as you're looking at the different databases, um, they're all gonna be different, but they're all gonna have the same basic concepts and options. So if you're not seeing what you're looking for, uh, but you know it should be there, keep looking because they probably just have it in a different spot. Um, and I'm gonna pause here and see if anybody has questions about specific database usage because it is a big topic. Does anybody have a particular database that they like? Most of my research that I've done has all been through the library for a &M or TC. I don't normally go to Google Scholar. Um, so that was, that was neat to see the difference um, stuff that we have access to through the library versus that. But now I don't have any questions at this moment, but I'm sure as I go through it, I'll have some questions on my email. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing. A lot of times you don't come up with your questions until you're in the middle of it. And, and at that point, you just need to figure out who do I, who do I message? Who do I email? How do I find this out? Um, and we'll go into how to, how to locate help too. I'm um, your name down for my phone, a friend. Definitely. Um, and then I see, um, you said ProQuest for education. Yeah, ProQuest has some really great education databases, especially that um, dissertations and theses uh, database that they have. Um, it's really, really helpful for uh, the most up-to-date research that people are doing while they're still, you know, in school, um, completing their degrees. So it's a lot of cutting edge stuff. Um, TextQuest, TextQuest is awesome. Um, we use the kind of university level version, which is called TechShare. So it has, a, it has, it's like a big package that we buy that has a ton of different databases and it's really handy. All right, I think we're gonna move along. We're gonna look at peer review again, briefly here. Um, so remember that peer review means it's been examined by experts before publication. This is extremely important. Um, this means that it's not just coming directly from anybody uh, on the internet, anybody in the world and going right into a professional journal. Um, it's, it's coming from some resource that is trusted uh, by, the, by the field that it's in. So drawing back on what we were talking about earlier with peer review, um, peer review is also some kind, sometimes called refereed. It's, it's essentially the same terminology as far as, um, as, far as being reviewed by experts before publication. So if you see refereed or peer review, it's, it's essentially the same idea here. Um, now I was talking earlier about another way to find out if a journal is peer reviewed. And we actually have a database for that specifically. Um, it's got a lot of other information in it too, but it will tell you if a periodical or a journal is peer reviewed. So it's called Ulrich's Web and it is in that A to Z database list. So if you go to the library website, you go to locate databases and you go to that A to Z database page and look for Ulrich's web and it'll be in there. And then instead of having actual articles or videos, it has information about journals. So once you open this, you can type the name of the journal that your article is in and you can search for it. So the name of the journal, not the article title itself. So if we search in here for the source of our Gale Literature Criticism online article about Walt Whitman, um, which was, it was called Poetry Criticism, then we can check to make sure it's not peer reviewed. 
Um, many other items are going to come up in the search that it thinks are, are close. So we've got, you know, Italian poetry review in there, um, criticism, contemporary poetry review, but that poetry criticism option right at the very top that says publisher Gale, um, that's that's the right one that we're looking for. We can tell because the publisher is Gale and that, that it was a Gale database that had that. So um, if there's a lot of similar titles, you'll have to look more closely at um, the publisher information and other options, but uh, usually the it's pretty good at finding the exact right one. Now the third column here, not the check boxes, not the little blue one, but the black black and white striped referee shirt. Um, <laughs> that is that is the icon that we're looking for to see if it's peer reviewed. Now um, Ulrich's web does specifically call it refereed, um, which is why I think they use that little that little icon. But um, but it, like I said, it's it's essentially the same idea. Um, now if we search for that journal poetry criticism and it comes up and we have no little refereed mark there. That means it's not refereed, it's not peer reviewed. If we look at a journal that we know is peer reviewed, like the American Journal of Health Education, we're gonna see that little shirt icon in that, in that column. And now the reason on the bottom here um, where it's got American Health, Journal of Health Education, it's got three different ones right there. Those are actually just different formats. It's This is a very thorough database. So it's got print, it's got electronic, and it's got microfiche on there. So um, as long as you know the title of the article, the publisher, and you're not necessarily worried about the, um, the exact format, you know, if there's three and they all have it, then you're good. So Ulrich's Web is in the A to Z database list. You search for the journal not the article title, not the database title that you found it in, but the journal that the article is from, which would be in the citation. Um, you look for that refereed mark, and if it's marked, you do have a peer-reviewed article. If it's not marked, you do not have a peer-reviewed article. So kind of get a closer look at peer review, how to identify that in that section. And I'm gonna pause here and just ask if anyone has any questions specifically about peer review. I had a quick question. Are they saying that Gale doesn't do peer reviewed articles or is just that one article is not peer reviewed? So in this specific instance, um, Gale is more of a publisher and more of a content aggregator. So um, Gale has a lot of different journals that are gonna be peer reviewed and not peer reviewed. So when we search in Ulrich's web for a journal, it's just looking at that one journal. So Gale might have um, other resources that are peer reviewed. And if we looked up an article and it had a journal title that was, you know, that was not one of the literature reviews, but a um, more scientific article, that one is probably gonna be more in the peer reviewed kind of field because it's less opinion based information and more scientific based. So if we searched in there, it might still say the publisher's Gale, but for that specific, re that specific journal, it might be peer reviewed. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Cool. All right. So this last section here is basically just reviewing how to find help when you get stuck. Getting help. Um, now, even after taking this class, you might still get stuck once in a while, and that's perfectly fine and perfectly normal. Um, you are not a library searching expert. That's not your job. Your job is to be a student and to be a researcher and a learner. And we're here to be the experts for you in the library stuff. So if you get stuck and you need to ask questions, that's what we're here for. We literally get paid for that. So it's okay. It's acceptable. You don't have to feel dumb. You don't have to feel like you, you, you missed something. Um, it's normal. And sometimes there's an actual problem with the library's website that we have to fix or a vendor has cut off access to something that we paid for and they said we don't pay for it but we did pay for it and sometimes we have to actually go in and fix stuff um, and it's not you <laughs> it's not user error <laughs> so it's perfectly acceptable to contact us and ask for help and we encourage it um, there are several different options for getting help on um, on the library's page, we've got these three buttons on pretty much every page, help, library guides, and schedule an appointment. 
Now the help button takes you to a page that has access to our LibChat, which is um, you can chat with a librarian at your college. Um, I log into that and cover that chat um, almost every weekday. And um, we've got other librarians that cover different time periods. So it, usually if the library is open, somebody's gonna be on that chat unless, you know, stuff happens. But there's also an after hours 24 seven help. That's the same chat function, but if we're not available, it connects you to a librarian that is somewhere else in the English speaking world um, that also is a university level librarian that can help you with your research. Now, they're not going to be able to answer specific questions about the John F. Moss Library and our policies necessarily, but they will be able to help you with research questions. They'll have access to our website so that they can see what databases that you have available to you. They'll have access to our um, our FAQs and everything so they can try to help um, figure out if there's a problem with something, how to fix it. And they can also contact us um, and let us know that we need to follow up with you. There's also an FAQ search on the help page, which is really handy. We've put a lot of work into trying to anticipate and um, and figure out what questions people are going to have as they go along, um, especially regarding um, COVID policies. If you if you go to the FAQs and search for COVID, it'll bring up everything that has to do with our current COVID policies and how to um, like how to reserve a place to come study in the library um, and how to order prints from the library if you want to just get something printed and come pick it up without having to go into the library to actually print it out from the computer lab. So there's lots of different options on there for um, for finding help with. COVID specific things. If you just search for COVID in the FAQs, very, very handy. It also on that page has the library phone number and email addresses uh, that you can contact us at. That library help at tamut.edu, that goes to all of the full-time librarians. So it, it gets you kind of a, a, a scattershot of, of your, your best hope to get a quick answer to your question. Now on the library guides page, it's it's um, for short, we call it LibGuides. It is, um, it's basically a collection of uh, pages that the library that we've made for you on specific classes or specific subjects. There's, there's over 77 guides currently. Um, we're always working on building more. And on that page, if you search for a particular topic like education, um, each guide has information on how to find books ebooks, databases, and journals that are about that specific field. And it's a great place to start a project if you're just kind of um, stumbling into, I have to research for this, this education class and I'm not sure kind of what to focus on, if there's a specific database I should be looking at. Um, these The library guide pages are going to have kind of a quick summary of that information for you. The schedule an appointment button is uh, basically you can make an appointment to talk to a librarian about your project. You can pick the day and the time from our calendars and let us know what you want our help with. The more information you can put in there, the better, honestly, because then we can prep ahead of time and we'll have less wasted time. We can kind of have a game plan ready for you at the beginning. Um, this can be a scheduled phone call. This can be a Zoom meeting. Um, right now we're, we are trying to limit in-person uh, encounters as it were. So um, probably gonna be a Zoom or phone. Um, if you are able to do a Zoom meeting with a librarian, that's gonna be the best because we can share our screen, we can show you stuff, we can, you know, it, 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 the visual helps sometimes. Um, so you can just schedule a time slot. And um, if, if there's any problem or anything, like if we need to reschedule, something comes up, we'll email you. Um, there's also, pre-scheduled library training. I haven't been doing as much of that recently. It's been more of a per request kind of situation, but we do have a calendar that shows what the trainings are that are upcoming and you can just sign up for them right on that calendar. So that was the find help section of, of the class here. Um, LibGuides, great place to start a project. The Ask Us chat or the 24 seven chat. Um, you can contact a librarian and email address, as always, that um, library help uh, at tamut.edu is great. You can also email me directly, um, just kendra.harrell at tamut.edu. That's my office phone number. So if I'm not in the office, 
I won't pick up. Um, email is the best way to get a hold of me. You can even say, you know, here's my phone number, give me a call back and I'll call you back. But um, the office number is a bit dodgy as far as me actually picking it up if I'm if I'm not working on campus that day. Um, the LibChat, you can go to libguides.tmut.edu slash help and go right to the LibChat option and you can make an appointment. And I believe, yep, that is my last slide. So uh, if anybody has any library related questions right now is the time. Although thinking, I just wanted to put another plug in for the uh, all those features. I mean, I work with doctoral students, and so um, you know, one of the big things that they have to do is they have to find a gap in in the research. And so, um, I remember a couple of times I've had students they're they're thinking that they got it all, and 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 so I've sent them to the librarian to help to make sure that gap is there. Um, so there's there's that, um, but the other thing, I've been on the library um, website and had some issues trying not finding exactly what I needed. And I remember, I think it was you actually, Kendra, one night. Um, I really didn't think I, I was like maybe quarter of ten at night or something, and I thought nobody's there. Well, Kendra was there, <laughs> so. And I like just like you said, I think you got me a, a chapter copied the next day. So I can't say enough about our, our librarians. They're good folk. Well, thank you. Yeah, we try and be pretty responsive. You know, when when we get a message from a student, we don't know if they need it within the hour or just whenever. So and it's usually within the hour. So we, we try and be pretty quick um, about hopping on things and getting stuff done as quickly as possible. So yeah, and there's, and I guess my big message to you all is just don't ever suffer in silence because there are so many people here to help you. Definitely, definitely. Like I said, they, they pay us for this. This is what we do. So please email me, say, I, I'm stuck. I don't even know what I'm, what I'm trying to find at this point. I'm frustrated. I'm looking for this. What do I do? What am I doing wrong? And we will figure it out. Um, and I'd also be happy to do, um, we can do another training class um, when it when it comes up when it's appropriate on um, some more in depth things about um, finding gaps in research and that sort of stuff if you want because um, that that is a big part of you know the upper level classes and really figuring out what kind of topic you want to do research projects on so yeah. there's a lot in there yeah. but this was just a basics kind of thing to kind of get you rolling with research and um, and then as you get deeper into it it can get more complicated yeah okay all right I'm going to stop our recording here and I'll have this up on YouTube in a little bit